Can Scotland's new First Minister unite his party? Is Margaret Thatcher's right to buy policy fuelling the housing crisis? And are AI chatbots politically biased? This is Politics Live. Joining me today, Conservative MP Bob Seeley, Preet Gill from Labour's Shadow Cabinet, Carla Denia, co-leader of the Green Party, and Emma Revel from the Centre for Policy Studies. Today, the Scottish Parliament will elect Hamza Youssef as the new First Minister. We are no longer Team Hamza or Team Ash or Team Kate. We are one team and we will be the team. We will be the generation that delivers independence for Scotland. But can he unite a divided party? We are now united and we unite behind Hamza. And still a space for you? Well, I would hope so. So this was your place and yeah. now it's look, one, two, three, four, five, six places. Gee whiz. Has Margaret Thatcher's flagship right to buy policy contributed to our current housing crisis? And is Elon Musk right that AI chatbots are politically biased? Let's start with something completely different and have a look at this headline in today's mail. Fury as households could be forced to pay to have seven different waste bins. Amid fears, councils may push cost of government green scheme onto taxpayers. Now, this uh, follows on from a government consultation on the issue of recycling. The government wants to encourage more of it uh, and try to address some of the disparities across authorities in England. Um, let me start off by asking you, how many bins do you have currently? I was thinking about this on the way here. I have a green bin, I have a black bin, I have a cardboard bin, don't always use. That's three. And I have a caddy. But the secret of, of having fewer bins, which, and I'm going to give a shout out to the Art of White, because our council has one of the most efficient uh, recycling schemes in Europe, we recycle 98%, is that you recycle the stuff that's in the green bin and you recycle the stuff that's in the black bin and then you are allowed to incinerate what comes out of both because then you produce, on the island, we produce electricity for 6,000 homes and from this summer, hopefully, we'll start to produce the byproduct, the steam okay. byproduct is going to heat the hospital. Well, very efficiently outlined. Um, so you've got four bins. I have got four bins. Would you like any more? No, I'm very happy with just four. And I think the simpler you make it, the better. Oh. But you need to be able to recycle the black bin and the green bin. And that's why uh, the Isle of Wight does it so brilliantly. Preet, do you think people need more bins? How many have you got? Well, I've got four, but imagine if you live in a rural area, you could probably have seven bins. But, of course, if you live in a terrace house in the city, where on earth are you going to put all the bins? And you've got to really look at cost versus impact. So councils are saying this is going to cost a lot of money. It's about actually changing behaviours. Is it really going to make the impact that it's going to have? I mean, local authorities have a huge amount of cuts. And actually, Labour Run Wales has done really well in the last 10 years. They've seen an increase of people from 4.8% to over 65%. So some of this is about shifting behaviour. Um, but actually, does it make the difference? Because it's less than 15% that household waste actually quite contributes in terms of, you know, net zero. And so actually, should we be doing more around plastics? That's certainly what Labour would do. I mean, if you want to encourage people to recycle more uh, and do it more effectively, Carla, what's your situation in Bristol? Well, I think we are all agreed that we need to recycle more of mat valuable materials mm. and stop just tipping them into the ground or burning them. Have you got and how many I think, things have you got? Um, I, I and most people in Bristol have five or six, um, depending oh, right. on whether they have a garden waste bin or not. Um, and, yeah, if you've got a, a, a spacious front garden, that's fine. But if you're in flats, it's, it's not. And, in mm. fact, many people in flats don't have the, the full recycling range at the moment. I think that we could learn a lot from Wales, actually. Um, many Welsh councils have really good recycling rates and they do have lots of different sections. But rather than having seven completely different bins blowing around in the street, they'll have one unit that has several compartments. And so I think this is slightly, slightly scaremongering talking about seven bins. I think the ideal solution, the common sense solution, is to, yes, have compartmentalisation, but to have it in a neat and tidy way. And I think there are several Welsh councils that are showing the way on that. You're nodding uh, them in agreement. How many bins do you have? I've got four big wheelie bins and a small food caddy. 
four big wheelie bins. Yeah, I mean, I live in a six person shared house. So we have, luckily, we've got a, fr a very small front garden, which is almost entirely bins. That's what it's for, effectively. Yeah. Uh, but my, my neighboring properties who are split into two flats, for example, they have got twice as many bins because it's two properties, yeah. but they haven't got the space for twice as many bins. Never mind if we started adding additional. And if you go around the corner, they don't have front gardens for those terraced houses. It, the street is full. You couldn't get a wheelchair. You couldn't get a buggy past mm. them. It's just full of bins. So I think we need to consider not only the cost for councils and households, but the practicalities of where they would go. Do you agree with that? Oh, sorry, go on, Carla. I was going to say, what's recycling is important, but what's even better than recycling is not producing that waste in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, there's, there's, um, there's work being done in the Scottish Government at the moment about a deposit return scheme, which will stop things getting into the waste stream in the first place. Yes, although I think that's run into a certain number of, of problems. Un a sadly, incredibly unsuccessful policy. So it would be nice if they actually... Well, it's being blocked by the Conservative Government. But I you think say that's it's a little bit different. To... <laughs> well, you are muttering it's easier said than done. Why, why is that in because, general look, as a principle? Because the more bins you have, the more frustrated people are going to get because they've got lives to lead. So the simpler you make the scheme, the better. But for that, you need to be doing two things. You need to recycle black, the, the black bin stuff if you've got the capacity, and that means investment in plant, and you need to be able to incinerate safely so you don't pollute the world, but you turn that incinerated material into electricity and byproducts but as well. But you're making the public actually pay for an initiative that you actually should be supporting the public to actually recycle, change their behaviours, because councils Would have you, faced huge amounts of cuts and people are going to have sorry, to pay for recycling. I, sorry, I don't, I don't I mean, understand the argument. We have a, we have a very competitive... Well, people rate, are going though. to have to pay for their bins. They're, they're having to start to pay for the green bins now because of the cuts to... Yeah. You are paying for garden funding. waste bins in a lot of now. areas. I mean, yes, you're making people pay for the very thing that the government needs to show leadership on. Labour councils. Labour Wales is showing the leadership. I'm sorry. Okay, when it comes to recycling, let's have some uh, facts here. The worst recyclers in Britain is uh, the, La uh, the Green Council in Brighton. The best recycling across Britain is done by Conservatives, who have That's who, actually who, not are, quite true. who are who are who <laughs> no. are way ahead of Labour councils when it comes to recycling. All right. Well, you've made quite a charge. Go on then. What's your view of it? Well, no, I, I, I'm going to disagree with that because, as we've just heard, Labour, what you know, Labour and Wales has just uh, shown that if you invest and if you do it properly and you take the public with you. Over 65% of people are recycling. We've got so much more to do on this. And the government can't sorry, just make people pay. Either the local authorities, let's change behaviours. Well, how was the population of Isle of Wight? 140,000, but we're all recycling. Right. Uh, what about Brighton? Well, I think that often how well the recycling works is a function of what kind of housing you have. Mm. Brighton and Hove is a very built-up city where there's lots of buildings split into flats that don't well, have the terrible, space. And that's why a simple separated but easy to use system that works just as well for blocks of flats as it does for large country houses in councils typically run by the Conservatives. It needs to work for all possible types of houses. And let's leave it there. Um, <laughs> yesterday, uh, the new leader of the SNP was announced, Hamza Yousaf. He's going to be confirmed by MSPs as Scotland's new First Minister uh, in the next hour or so. Let's take a look at a couple of the front pages. Uh, the Daily Record has historic day for Scotland. Hamza the first. And let's have a look at the national history made as Yusuf wins. New SNP leader is on course to become the first Muslim first minister. And the Scotsman. Referring to problems ahead, potentially Yusuf faces <coughs> uphill battle to unite a divided party. Well, let's put that question to Stuart Hosey, the SNP MP. He joins us now. Hello to you, uh, Stuart. Hey. Um, it's not going to be easy, is it? It was an acrimonious campaign. I watched those debates as the candidates took lumps out of each other. How can Hamza Yousaf really bring the SNP back together after all the cracks that that contest exposed? Well, I'm not sure I actually did show that many cracks. I mean, Hamza is only the fifth person to lead the SNP in 40 years. Uh, this is the first contested leadership we've had in 20 years. Uh, I'm not surprised some of the things said were a little spicy, of course they were. <laughs> but I thought the uh, answers or the comments by uh, Ash Reagan and uh, Kate Forbes afterwards were extremely helpful. Mm. And I've got absolutely no doubt my soundings from the party at large is that the party will come together and come together extremely quickly. Well, you mentioned uh, Kate Forbes and Ash Regan. Of course, together they received over half the votes. Um, is Kate Forbes, and should she, be offered a job 
in well, Hamza Yusuf's cabinet? I, I, I suspect that Hamza will offer both Kate and Ash uh, a role in government. I'm, I'm pretty confident about that. A role but, in government, but I'm talking about actually in his top team. Well, it, the decisions as to who is asked to take which role mm. is a matter entirely for the First Minister. But I'm and asking please, your opinion. <coughs> I, I think he will almost certainly offer them a role in government. That's my opinion. I, I, I think that's exactly what he'll do. Right. I mean, have you had any discussions at all with Hamza Yousaf about what he may or may not do? I haven't spoken to him since he was elected. I spoke to him during the campaign a couple of times, uh, some uh, bits of insight here and there. Uh, but I suspect he will be an extremely good leader, if for no other reason than he's <laughs> inordinately personable. Uh, he's very empathetic, mm. and I think he'll bring people with him. Right, but why, why would Kate Forbes want a position um, in Hamza Yousaf's cabinet? She trashed his record, as you know. Uh, she said when he was transport minister, the trains were never on time. When he was justice minister, the police were strained to breaking point. And as health minister, uh, we've got, she said, a record high waiting times. Um, why would she want to take a job? Well, I think she'd want to take a job because... Uh, she believes in Scottish independence. She believes the SNP are the vehicle to deliver that. And by and large, she believes uh, and agrees with the positions of the party. And in terms of the critiques that were made, as I say, things are said during election campaigns. What, you think she didn't believe those things? I think the actuality is that Scotland has got the best court waiting times in the whole of the UK. The trains mm -hmm. do run on time and the strikes ah, in Scotland so were was, resolved and so resolved she, well, rather quickly. Well, she was wrong. I mean, I it, have to... It, no, 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 Joe, this is really important. I mean, you're making these assertions and... I'm not come, making any assertions. When, when it, come on, this is what she it, said when, in the contest. Those are her to, words. When it comes to things like justice, we've got the lowest crime rate since 1974. Meanwhile, in England, barely 5% of crimes reported even end up with somebody charged. Mm. Now, am I saying things are perfect? No, of course they're not perfect. Governments are there to fix problems, and these problems will be addressed and they'll be resolved. But I think uh, if our political opponents think one or two things said in anger during a leadership contest is a big win for them in an election in two or three or four years' time, I suspect they don't quite have what they think they have. Well, let's just have a look at the figures uh, today, um, just after the contest has finished. Maybe she has got a point, Kate Forbes. Let's uh, show you. I know you can't see it, but I'll read you the headline, uh, Stuart Hosey in the Herald. A&E waits worsen again on Yusuf's last day as health secretary. Uh, very clearly behind both NHS England and Wales when it comes to A&E waiting times, with just 62.9% of patients seen on time, compared to, as I say, both England and Wales. Scotland is the worst. She's got a point, hasn't she, Kate Forbes, in terms of his record? Every single NHS in the UK has struggled, particularly sure. over the last three years, for reasons which we know. Uh, for the last umpteen months, the Scottish position had been much better and was getting better. Things do happen in, in health services. We see that across the UK. No, I, I don't think she does have a point. Well, she, I think these are simply challenges which must be addressed and which will be addressed. Well, no, she does have a point because it's backed up by the figures. Since last June, Scotland is performing less well than both England and Wales, and that's according to the official uh, Public Health Scotland, NHS England and figures in Wales since last June when Hamza Yousaf was health minister. Well, I've not seen those figures. You said they've come well, out today. I will happily look at them. But as I say, waiting times had been improving. Uh, the waiting times and many other metrics in the NHS in Scotland uh, were the best of all the NHSs in the UK. It's not without its challenges, no. but those challenges are there to be addressed and they will be addressed. Yeah, maybe Kate Forbes can have the uh, role of health minister in Hamza Yousaf's uh, government. Um, when it comes to the issue of independence, uh, the core uh, of the being of the SNP, um, what is going to be Hamza Yousaf's first step? Is it going to be putting in another request for a referendum, another independence referendum to Westminster, which they've already said they'll decline? Well, he seems to have said he's going to make the request a Section 30 transfer for the powers to hold the referendum. Mm. Uh, I think that's a sensible thing to do, not least because the what? Scottish Government, the SNP, uh, has a mandate 
to hold a referendum. But more importantly than that, he said during the campaign he intends to bring the party together and the wider yes movement so we, consider, we could consider in detail with all the nuances that you can't do on television, uh, all of the various routes by which we might get to independence. And I think the conclusion of that will be very instructive about how we campaign, whether we simply go for a referendum, uh, whether we run a an election as a de facto referendum, or perhaps whether there's some other route. Oh. I think the conclusion of that, hopefully in short order, it will determine exactly the route to independence that Scotland will take. Right. I mean, just before I come back to you on that, uh, Bob, on the Section 30, um, on asking, uh, again, Westminster for an independence referendum on the electoral wins and strength of the SNP, do you think Westminster should reconsider? No, I don't. Um, it was pretty clear during the election camp or the referendum campaign, and Nicola Sturgeon said herself that it was a once-in-a-lifetime vote. That was it according to the SNP's leadership. And I just wish not only the SNP, but actually the media base in Westminster, if you look at the Scottish people, what they actually want, all the polling suggests that independence comes seventh after a whole bunch of things, crime and health and all the stuff that Hamza Youssef has done really badly and all the stuff that the SNP has failed miserably on. So, again, we're obsessing about something well. that doesn't obsess the Scottish people only the SNP. Stuart? And I wish the SNP would get back to actually trying to govern a lot we, better we, we, than they have. Well, done. you would say that because you're a unionist, but um, Stuart, what's your response? Well, my response is that the SNP have won the last elections, eight elections in a row in Scotland. We've won mandate after mandate. The opinion polls do bobble about around the 50% Under. for and against independence. Uh, I think uh, Bob Seeley is uh, absolutely wrong. Uh, you know, I think if someone whether the unionist or not, was to actually respect the fact that Scotland's a nation, and the nations have the right to become independent, they've got the right to self-determine, have the confidence of their own position. I absolutely respect it. it. I absolutely it, respect it. But you had a once-in-a-generation and a once-in-a-lifetime vote. No, so no, no, stop no, no, trying no. to have a vote every other week until you win it. Oh, Bob, please. We're not having a vote every other week. Uh, you're after trying 2014, to. You're trying to have vote after vote until you win it. We the respect, fact is, you had a once-in-a-generation, once-in-a-lifetime vote, you lost it, move on, and actually try to govern... Well, let him answer. We respected the result, Bob, which is why the Scottish National Party are still here at Westminster in considerable numbers compared to all of the unionist parties combined. But democracy doesn't stand still. We keep winning elections, we keep winning mandates, yeah. and I think not instead of lecturing me, Bob, no, it would I'm be not better... Lecturing. I'm just pointing out that you had a once-in-a-lifetime vote. For unionists, lost it. Tories in particular, to respect that when the Scottish people change their mind, Unionism should change its mind as well. All right, let me ask Preet. Well, hang on, let me ask, let me ask uh, Preet, uh, because uh, what Stuart Hosey says is true. It's been broadly split, uh, yes and no, at 50-50. That means you've made no headway, really, at all, in persuading people to come and support the Labour Party in Scotland, either at Holyrood elections or at general elections. I don't buy that. I mean, look, Hamza Youssef is unpopular with voters. He's got a divided party. He's got some huge challenges. He's been a, a failure in all the ministerial So you're relying on his demise no, rather no, 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 than no, no, what no, you have to offer. Not. The problem with, uh, with the SNP at the moment is they don't actually have a plan for people in Scotland. People in Scotland care about the cost of living crisis. They want a government that's on their side, that has a plan. It's Labour that will help people <coughs> save £1,400 every single year with our plan in terms of investing in the Green Prosperity Plan. This is the kind of leadership, actually, that people in Scotland Scotland want and deserve. Uh, I'll, Stuart, I'll come back to you in just a moment. Carla. Well, Bob's been avoiding the fact that there is a majority in favour of independence in Holyrood with the SNP and the Greens working together. And actually, that government has already been tackling the cost of living crisis in Scotland. They've brought in a suite of fantastic policies, including free bus travel for all young people, uh, a massive investment in making homes more energy efficient, getting off coal, getting off fracking, um, you know, environmental policies, social policies, really shutting looking out for the gas. people of Scotland. Shutting down oil and gas. We need gas for another 10, 20 years. You're shutting down supply in this country. You're trying to. This is a disaster. It's economically a disaster. It's a disaster for jobs and a disaster for energy security. Come Actually, on. they've been doing a lot of work on what's called a just transition. So that's helping workers in the oil and gas sector to move to greener industries. Why don't, why don't poll actually, after poll why don't shows that... Investing? I'll just finish if it's OK. Poll after poll shows that workers in those industries 
countries often really want to work in renewable energy, um, but they need the route to get there, whether that's skills passports or other mechanisms. There are people that work in oil and gas that know it's not the future. They want to get out, and the Scottish Greens are helping with that. Look at drugs. All right, well, NHS 8 waiting list. I mean, these are big issues. Well, let's, Stuart, come back. Stuart, do you want to respond to that? I'll just respond to one piece because there's a huge amount of things being said, but Preet said the SNP were divided. Uh, unfortunately, yep. the SNP are actually rather united now we've got this election, a uh, leadership election done. I think the real issue the Labour Party have, apart from looking very much like Tories, is they're stopping Jeremy Corbyn standing much against the wishes of many of their members. And, of course, they've lost 100,000 or so members in recent times. I think if any party is split and divided and there's nothing to offer the Scottish people, sadly, it's the Labour Party. Disagree. Can I just put to you, Carla, your party, the Greens, are in a governing coalition with the SNP, uh, your sister party, certainly, in Scotland, and very keen on the gender recognition reform uh, bill, which actually caused an awful lot of problems uh, for Nicola Sturgeon. Are you optimistic that Hamza Youssef is going to try and recommit to that bill and that piece of legislation? Yes, I am optimistic, and uh, reform to the gender recognition uh, laws was part of the Butte House agreement between the SNP and the Green Party, so I know that the Scottish Greens are very keen to see that go forward. There's a lot of misinformation that circulates about gender recognition reform, about suggesting that it's to do with accessing certain spaces. What it's about is making sure that trans people have dignity. It's about making sure that their marriage certificates and their death certificates accurately record their gender, something that the rest of us take for granted. And it's quite a small change, really, but it could have a really big benefit for the people who are affected. Uh, Stuart, will that be a commitment? I think he's already made that commitment. Remember the GRR bill is the most consulted on uh, and longest time to deliver bill in the whole of the Scottish Parliament. It's done perfectly legally. And the issue here is now not about the substance of gender recognition. It's about the anti-democratic actions of the UK government All right. trying to stop a properly passed piece of Scottish legislation. Stuart Hosey, thank you very much uh, for joining us. I have some important uh, breaking news for you, and that is that MI5 has raised the threat in Northern Ireland, um, and that is in relation to Northern Ireland-related terrorism, and it's raised from severe uh, to severe, I should say, from substantial. So, the threat in Northern Ireland has been raised too severe from substantial. The Northern Ireland Secretary, Chris Heaton-Harris, announced the move in a written statement to the Commons, and you can see more reaction to that on BBC News Channel. Just before we go on, a quick word on the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. Should now, should the government in Westminster withdraw their block? No, we should have over overruled it, and Rishi did exactly the right thing. Putting male rapists in female prisons and calling it justice is absurd. This is a deeply divisive issue. You've got to take the British public with you. To ignore them, you ignore them at your peril. That's exactly what Hans Abusev is doing. He's creating a dividing issue on something where we already have strong legislation to protect the very people that you are talking about. All right, let's talk about housing, because we're going to show you an excerpt from last night's Panorama investigation into what's happening with ex-council housing in England. That was after Margaret Thatcher's flagship right to buy policy in the 1980s. Uh, Avril bought her council home in Lewis in 1984 for £15,000 and sold it for £85,000 four years later. It's now in the hands of a private landlord. She went back with BBC <coughs> reporter Richard Bilton to see what it's like now. Your old kitchen is this gentleman's home and he pays 960 quid a month for it. I think it's disgusting, absolutely disgusting. What was once a family home is now six bedsits and a lucrative business. It's estimated that 40% of the council homes sold in London are now owned by private landlords. I feel very sad it's ended up like this because this is horrible. Has this shown that the right to buy policy has been a failure in the long term? No, I don't think it has. I watched the Panorama show yesterday. I thought it was very interesting and it highlighted a lot of problems with the housing crisis. But that were the, they were the problems that were highlighted. Housing, not just social housing, not just right to buy. There, are, there were examples uh, in the rest of the show on you know, damage in council-owned properties, 
ones that were still owned by other housing associations and ones that were bought and sold under right to buy. The issue is, fundamentally, we don't build enough homes in this country full stop, and that causes problems in every different type of property, whether you're renting from a private landlord, a social landlord or a housing association. Bob? It's a, it's a very complex issue. When you're asking me, was right to buy a mistake? No, it was, it was absolutely a great policy and a very, very popular one. It was 40 years ago and an awful lot has happened since then. So to say after 13 years of a new Labour government, 12 years of a Tory coalition government, that you can blame problems on stuff 40 years ago, I, I don't really buy. We absolutely need, and I'm very supportive of, uh, in my patch on the Isle of Wight, it, I want the council to be building council housing. I want affordable housing, I want as housing associations to build generally affo genuinely affordable yeah, but housing they haven't done. for young people. But well, they... hold on, but we're putting 11 and a half, the government is committing <clears throat> at 11 and a half billion to help affordable housing. So we have a massive affordable housing scheme. Can I just ask, answer the point about, um, you made a very important point about household formations are not building enough. If you look at household formations, it aver averages about 130,000 a year. So there's 130,000 new household formations every year, so new households. We are even in bad years, we are building something like 180 to 200,000. And, and over that them. period, so in the, uh, our, our 12 years compared to Labour, we built more, more affordable housing. Well, you can trace statistics generally, but there hasn't yeah. been enough housing. House, household, formation is a, uh, household formation is a really poor statistic to use because I live with five yeah. housemates. We are one household. We don't want to be one household. I love my housemates dearly, we get on very well, but in an ideal situation we wouldn't live together, we would live in our own properties. Those sure. households formation is being held back by the lack of property. Well, well, but is there a problem with right to buy, first no. of all? They was there a problem at the time? You still support it, but when you look at the problems, and you say it's 40 years, yes it is, it's a long time ago, but did it lay the ground for council homes then being sold into the private market for vastly inflated prices, uh, which was their right to do, uh, reduce that how council housing stock to such a level that it's actually priced out a whole younger generation of people from being able to do exactly as Emma would like to, perhaps not share a house with five people. I mean, look, Labour supports the principle of everybody owning their own home and certainly something we want to do because you've got 1.1 million people on waiting lists. I mean, this is hugely catastrophic. It's because the government has failed to build more homes. The thing is, if people buy, you've got to replace what you're selling with, with stock. And of course, our stock is really old, but we have got no ambition from this government. It doesn't actually have a plan in terms of saying we need to build X amount of homes, but also what about homes for older people? So thinking about how do we unlock bigger properties? What kind of homes do we actually need that are fit for the future? <laughs> and the thing is, you know, it is not right um, that people, you know, first-time buyers don't actually have access to the market. They're out This agree. is something Labour will absolutely but address. I, I completely agree. And I'll give you an example, OK, because I know my patch, I know the housing market there. For 50 years, we have not built for young people on the island, regardless of what government and, frankly, what the colour of the council was. And so what we need to do, and one of the things that I did during the planning... Why let me not? Just, let me why just has, make a point. One of the things... I don't know. One of the things that I did during the planning... That's honest. One, one of the things that I did during the planning rebellion mm. was to make sure that my ah. council on the Isle of Wight... Let me finish the point. ..has the power to say we are pretty much going to go hell for leather and build and focus overwhelmingly on building affordable homes for young but islanders. But you campaigned against ma mandatory housing targets. Yes, because you need to have the variability. And the one thing that many of us are against is this reliance, and it's a very unenvironmentally friendly reliance, on greenfield, low density, poor quality, anti-climate change, car dependent, housing estates outside town centres. All right, what well, we let them respond. Bob, do, do, you, do, you know, do you know what science? your government is doing? It's saying to developers that they no longer no, have to pay the Section spending, 106 payment, which is more billion, schools more housing, well, social housing. We're, we're spending 11 billion how on affordable Bob, Let her answer. My goodness, I mean, how can you say that? The 106 payments for developers is about providing local resources, having social housing uh, properties, having schools. You're scrapping all of that. No, so not only are you sorry. not building, sorry. but you're now actually letting sorry, developers that, that get is, away with it. Sorry, it's just that is true. Bob's rant about low-density greenfield development with no amenities was truly bizarre because those developments happen because of lax regulation because of the Conservative government. We here in, in rural areas where Greens are getting lots of councillors elected in places like Suffolk and Herefordshire, the frustration with massive four, five, six bedroom homes with double garages, but with no schools, no doctor's surgeries, no way of getting anywhere without reliance on a car, but that's all happening because of Conservative exactly the national point government I'm policy. That I, we want to change that policy. So we're trying to change that because I think having 
car dependent, out of town, greenfield um, building sites which are unconnected to communities, are bad for people, they're bad for my young people. It's not a rant, it's actually something I'm really passionate about well, hang because on, I want to get people living in communities near public services and actually to, to help first time buyers. And right. indeed, but hang on, Bob, sellers. the conclusion, Emma, is that just not enough houses are being built, isn't it? Yes, for a variety of different reasons, most of which are related to how incredibly difficult it is to get planning permission. Uh, but also, you know, all due respect to Bob, politicians like Bob, who object to various different types of planning in their area, they go, oh, the on. amenities aren't there, we need to build the amenities as well. Of course we do. But the idea that people... It doesn't matter, really, how beautiful you try and make it. There was always someone who's going to say, not here, this isn't the right place, we need to build on brownfield. We don't have enough brownfield as a country. A lot of brownfield is not so suitable for housing because it used to be a petrol station or a factory and the cost of cleaning it up would be, you know, would push up the price of housing. We need to build more Let me let Carla in and then I'll come back to you. Refocusing on the question raised by that panorama episode, I think it makes the point very clearly that green politicians and much of the public have known for a long time, which is that right to buy is a slum landlord's charter. Uh, a significant proportion of former council homes in London, as the documentary showed, are now private rented and often in very poor quality. And that's why the Greens think that right to buy has to go. It's the one of the many problems with right to buy is that it reduces the amount of social housing in this country. We have the fourth councils, highest housing stock in Europe. We, and we it's don't have much lower than it used to be. And partly that's because councils do not receive enough funding to either build new or buy new council houses to make up for the ones that are sold off. And when they do it manage, reducing, they're objected to. It is reducing social housing by stealth by the Conservatives, and I'm actually quite disappointed to hear that Labour support it as well. Right, well, and why do you support no, it? No, we support because the principle of people being able to own their own property is absolutely the right one. I mean, but the mm. thing what we're seeing is that properties are now being turned into bedsits and flats, you know, mould, damp, the mm. conditions that people mm. are living in are absolutely awful. HMOs are being set up where vulnerable people are being placed without any support. The government's failing to bring any regulation. It talks the talk all of the time, but it's happy for people to be put into substandard accommodation. Well, I think it's okay. You were singing, you were singing uh, the praises of the uh, Labour government in Wales, where actually they've decided to scrap right to buy. Well, they did it in 2019. Was that a mistake? Well, I mean, obviously, it's about the money that they get from central government in terms of being able to afford to buy new properties, uh, you know, to, uh, to build more new properties and have more housing and replace its old stock. And, of course, this all comes back down to funding. If you strip councils away from funding, you really, uh, you know, you're not going to get the house built that you expect. And now you're impacting the social housing association sector because now you're extending right to buy within that. OK, well, you seem a bit confused about whether you support right no, to buy No, I support the right to buy. But, I've made but, it very clear. The well, principle is absolutely okay. right. Would you yes, support it being extended? which is what Boris Johnson had recently uh, suggested Just when he was points. Prime Minister. It hasn't happened, and that was two housing associations. Um, I would, actually, but let me... Uh, hold on, but I, I will be more specific about that. Firstly, when it comes to investment in affordable and social housing, the government's committing £11.5 billion for a massive expansion of it because we understand we need to get building. It's a question of building in the right places where young people want to live, which is not some out-of-town housing estate. When it comes to right to buy, I support it. In my patch, I want, again, I want flexibility for councils and local communities to make their own minds. What I want actually is rent to buy because we have a limited housing stock on the island. We need to get young people into their first homes. We then need to support them as they build up a deposit because it's the deposit that's very often the critical bit. And when they build up a deposit, they can go out into the free market and buy a house. But it's getting that young pe people well, to be able to. If I go the back deposit. to the excerpt there in the film, one of the tenants uh, in that house divided into six bedsits was paying £960 a month to the private landlord. So we need I mean, to get building. And that's why Building? Got, or should and, there be rent controls? And, and, no, uh, sorry, OK. Everywhere there are rent controls, it sounds nice and it's a great line for a politician to say, more power to the state, let's have rent controls. If you look at the facts on rent controls in New York, in, in San Francisco, in yeah. Germany and Sweden, oh. you have less investment in housing. So if you think you've got bad housing now, if we had rent controls, it would be much worse. Carla? So actually you need a vibrant private sector and it's about making sure you get investment into that sector so that people have a choice. Carla? There is a place for private renting if it's a choice. But the mm. trouble is that there are there's a generation of people who cannot afford to buy ever. They are trapped in private renting, paying off somebody else's mortgage rather than their own, with no prospect of ever being able to buy because the, the rents are spiralling and bear no relationship to incomes anymore, especially in cities like my home city of Bristol, 
where, where rent is a real issue and where I seconded a motion to Bristol City Council earlier this year in support of rent controls. Now, currently, councils don't have the power to bring in rent controls, but this motion was about lobbying government for the power and doing the legwork locally now on how it could work. And just, I'll just finish. There are many different ways to skin a cat. There's lots of different ways to do rent controls. And there's a lot to be learnt from ones that have worked well, ones oh. that have worked slightly less well. The worry is... It can be tailored, well, let me, let it can me, be tailored uh, to the local situation. And that's why, rather than doing it nationally everywhere, we want to give councils the power to bring that in where it's needed. Emma? Rent controls do not address the underlying problem that we do not have enough housing. If you live in a property that becomes rent controlled, fantastic. You know, you've saved money, you're, 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 the worry of it increasing is gone. If you need to leave that property, then you have a problem. It only works if you are in a property that is suited to your needs. If your family breaks up or you want to have children or you want to move into someone with someone, you have to move out of that rent control property. The properties that are not rent controlled massively more expensive you have examples international examples of you know the wait for a rent control property in stockholm is 11 years you think social housing has a long waiting list rent control properties are even worse the problem is we do not have enough homes we need to build on and that why... on, on that i'm going to move you on to this headline in the mail on sunday it says google ai accused of left-wing bias tory mps fear revolutionary search tool will dent their election <coughs> hopes now this relates to artificial intelligence chatbots, software used to conduct an online chat conversation. The newspaper says that the Google Bard chatbot condemned Brexit as a bad idea, described Jeremy Corbyn as having the potential to be a great leader. That came after reports that Twitter owner Elon Musk thinks artificial intelligence chatbots are too woke. Are they biased? Well, look, some of the evidence suggests that they are, and some of the academic, uh, more importantly, some of the academic research shows that AIs are either getting programmed by people with left-wing opinions or uh, maybe they just look at different bits of the internet that give them the answers of a left-of-centre kind. More generally, I, I am worried about freedom of speech in, in the 21st century, whether it comes from the Communist Party in China shutting down freedom of speech absolutely in their country and oppressing their, their minority populations, or whether it comes from big search engines and the social media companies kiboshing debate on COVID. Mm. And I'm not talking about conspiracy theories. I'm talking about stuff like where the origins of the virus came from, and now there is potential evidence that it might have come from a laboratory. It's not a crazy fringe idea, and yet that sort of debate okay. was shut down. So right. I do think there is a problem about freedom of speech uh, and making sure that we have freedom of speech for everybody are within they, reason. Are they political bias? I think they're definitely biased, but we've got to be clear, what are they actually for? And this is where the government has really been absent in terms of really holding uh, the uh, social media companies to account. The online social harms bill is coming through. I'm worried about disinformation, how it's going to be used to spread disinformation. We already see on social media, on Twitter, how bots are turned on and off by many countries that want to influence and uh, attack us. So what is it actually for? So if you're reporting a crime to the police and you've got somebody, you know, saying, here's your reference number, thank you very much, and you've responded, absolutely fine. But, uh, but you know, and, and also, let's not forget, in certain countries there's legislation. So mm. why are the bots not actually share, uh, sharing information that's actually right. accurate and, and reflective in terms of that country and what it actually means, rather than sharing their concerns and their woke issues on some of these issues, as, <laughs> as reported? Let's talk to Zoe Kleiman, the BBC's technology editor. Why might AI chatbots show political bias, Zoe? Well, I think it's really interesting uh, to look at this. You know, we know that AI and bias is a thing. We absolutely are aware of that. Um, the reason is that it gets its information from the internet. The internet itself, as we know, is full of misinformation mm. and also full of bias. So, you know, in the case of, for example, I think the Mail on Sunday took the example of Brexit and it asked ChatGPT whether Brexit was bad and it said that ChatGPT replied that it was. Now, you have to bear in mind that people tend to complain about things more than praise them. It's quite possible that people who are upset about uh, the Brexit vote are more likely to be more vocal about it on the internet and therefore there might be more negative stuff about Brexit on the internet than there is positive stuff and that's where ChatGPT is getting its knowledge from. However, you know, it is absolutely up to the companies ultimately that create these ah, uh, these mm. these chatbots to make sure that they are uh, that they are not being biased and that they they are able to understand that, that what the information that they have isn't necessarily the information that is correct I asked it myself by the way and I couldn't get it to give me an opinion it gave me a list of pros and cons uh, okay. given both sides right so it could be down to the sort of programming um, of these things and also uh, whether if you change that you might get a more nuanced answer 
I think that you, we need to look at um, exactly what AI is trained on. It's trained on massive data sets, enormous amounts of information. There have been examples over the years. So, for example, it used to be that, uh, you know, uh, algorithms that were programmed to recognize hands were given thousands, millions of pictures of hands. But mm. because most pictures on the Internet are white, they were all white hands, so they didn't recognize black hands. That was something that was picked up very early on as an issue that needed to be addressed. You know, what you put in ultimately is mm. what you get out. Right. What, what, what could be, they be used for in the future then? So there's a report that's out today which is suggesting that chatbots like ChatGPT could threaten, uh, I think, 300 million jobs. And I think we really do need to think seriously about this because they are so human-like in the way that they respond. You know, they can write, they can mimic copy, they give you information in, in, in a way that's very easy to understand. They don't yet speak. I think when they speak, you and I might be uh, thinking about alternative employment as well. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it, 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 we are really in the infancy of these things. Bear in mind, this is only version 4 of GPT that's out now and already it can do all of these things um, and I think you know we are at a real fork in the road in terms of where we're going to go mm. with it and what jobs are going to be affected. The people that make them argue that it frees you up to do other things. You know, do you want to spend four hours writing a PowerPoint presentation when ChatGPT can do it for you in two and a half seconds? But the question is will there be anything left for you to do that these bots aren't <laughs> doing already? Emma? Well I think it's really interesting because these programs do what what they're programmed to do so you know humans are biased we have biases naturally and you know we therefore put them into the programs that we create i, th I think from what i understand oh. the the microsoft one is uh will give you an opinion if you ask it to but the chat gpt sorry i've got this wrong way around but the chat gpt won't it gives you a very neutral sort of pros and cons even if you push it it won't give you an opinion so uh, you know it's it's something to be concerned about and i think aware of going forward but i don't think we should panic just yet well, as Zoe said, this is a well-known phenomenon in AI, but actually in technology generally. Um, there was a case a few years ago where automatic soap dispensers were not detecting the hands of people of colour um, because it wasn't reflecting the amount of light they'd been programmed to expect. <coughs> That's a real-world example of where the biases of people writing the software mm. that operates the soap dispenser in that case, or in the case of AI, it's simply the text that it scrapes off the internet to learn from. Humans are biased... Unfortunately, we can do what we can to tackle that, but we are, and therefore the software learns from us and carries that bias through. Was this bias, uh, Bob? Uh, this made <laughs> us laugh. Uh, your local newspaper, Meta's new AI uh, chatbot, blog. thinks Bob Seeley isn't very it's, nice. It's, it's an alt-left blog, and uh, I'm, I'm, in reality... In <laughs> it reality, could have said worse. It could in, have said in, a lot worse. In reality, I'm super cuddly. So, uh, But look, I mean, if nothing else, if chatboxes think that Jeremy Corbyn is, is going to be a great leader, they've obviously got a sense of humour, what can I say? <laughs> oh, pre is this something to be embraced? I mean, not that uh, Bob Seeley isn't very nice, but uh, in general, or do we need to change the people who are writing these programmes? I think, look, it's a re really exciting opportunity in terms of technological advancement, jobs for the future, but I think we have to be careful in terms of the biases that those creating them are able to install in them. So should they be focused Regulated. on fact, regulation? I think it's really important, the Online Social Harms Bill, we all want to hold the government to account. You know, it can say, oh, we're worried and it's, you know, leading towards this side or the other, but actually, what are you going to do about it? I mean, that's going to be the crux of it. Well, Michelle Donnellan has said trust the bots. She's the new science uh, secretary of state. Uh, should we? Uh, no. Uh, I disagree. Think... I'm afraid I disagree with what she says on that. Oh, right. So you, you don't think that we should embrace it. Why not? Well, uh, let's embrace it. But the idea that you trust AI, I know you've always got to be questioning the stuff and you've always got to be uh, making sure that we can continue to live in a human-centric world where we value human life and bots are there to support human life uh, in the long term and artificial intelligence is there for human freedom. 21st century, look, the bigger picture when it comes to geopolitics... Is it inevitable? 21st century, there is going to be a battle between two visions of humanity. There is going to be authoritarian states who are going to be using AI and big data mm. to oppress people, and there's going to be our open societies, and we have to use AI and big data to enhance human life. Fruit? Well, absolutely. I think, you know, it's, it's the point that I made earlier. You know, yes, of course, it's exciting. And, you know, this is an opportunity to think about ways that we can use it positively, create good jobs. We're quite way behind on that. But it's going to need regulation. It's going to need very stringent regulation. Ah, oh, so I that's said. what a Labour government so would do. Absolutely. Yeah, We've we got are. to be clear. What is it going to be used for? As you say, geopolitical actors, uh, disinformation. Oh. These are the kind of threats and risks that we've got to be... Well, careful. that's all we've got time for, well, well, I'm afraid. Well, you'll, have to, you'll have to hold it for another day. But thank you to all of my guests for joining me today. I'll be back tomorrow, of course, on PMQ's Day at 11.50. From all of us here, bye-bye.